so good morning to everybody. We've got a, a robust in-person audience, and, a, and we have uh, an audience from around the world uh, tuning into this special program. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, uh, and thank you for joining us for this today's, today's special event hosted in partnership with Edelman and in partnership with my friend Richard Edelman, a member of the International Advisory Board of the Atlantic Council, the Board of the Atlantic Council, and CEO of the uh, Public Relations Powerhouse Edelman. Uh, and this is going to be a discussion on uh, your annual trust barometer survey, uh, which you've been doing for 23 years, it's been tracked for 23 years. Um, it's an understatement to say it's been groundbreaking and it's, and, and it's watched every year by not just the business community, but civil society uh, and government as well. Uh, it surveys, for those who don't know about it, it's just, it examines how trust breaks down by sector uh, and takes a broader look at how the general population across different countries views institutions. Some of the differences in, uh, among countries are quite interesting. Every year I'm always interested in seeing which countries you've looked at a little bit more deeply and why. Uh, but it includes governments, businesses, NGOs, media companies, and it identifies opportunities for business and other leaders to build trust with their stakeholders. So you're not just putting out a survey, you're trying to help people learn from it. Um, and it's positioned Edelman as a global thought leader on, on, on trust and reputation management. Uh, you released it a few weeks ago uh, in Davos, where we both were, uh, in a non-snowy uh, and, and not particularly cold Davos. Uh, so we can talk about that as well. Um, and, uh, and it reveals a weakening social fabric marked by deepening divisions, uh, lack of faith in societal institutions, all triggered by economic anxiety, disinformation, mass class divide. That's one of the most interesting terms I saw in it, and you've returned to it again this year, mass class divide, which, uh, and failure of leadership. Uh, so I want to get right into the conversation uh, with Richard on this. Uh, I do want to say in Davos, it's really interesting because in 2022, we experienced geopolitical shock, uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. We experienced energy shock that rolled off of that and what happened with prices. Macroeconomic shock, the uh, slowdown in economies, the, uh, the growth of inflation. Um, and I still found people were uh, cautiously optimistic about 2023, partly because of um, the uh, worst case scenarios were avoided. It could have been worse in Ukraine, Putin could have won. It could have been worse in the economy, you could have gone in, into recession all over the place. Uh, inflation's now coming down a bit. So, uh, so people didn't know whether to be optimistic, pessimistic, and this gets a little bit to the divided uh, opinions that you're talking about in your own, in your own survey. So I wonder if we could kick this off, um, and I, I'm going. To, everyone here, and everyone uh, in our uh, virtual audience, you'll have a chance to ask questions. So please, as you hear the findings, think about what your questions would be. But first of all, I'd love to have you just uh, kick it off and give us a little bit of a review of what you found this year. Sure. <clears throat> so Fred, um, first of all, thank you for having me. The trust barometer has been going for 23 years, and we started it after the battle in Seattle in uh, 1999, the storming of the WTO meeting uh, over globalization and the sense that globalization was manifestly unfair to the workers. And we decided to study the impact of NGOs. And we found that NGOs were in fact the most trusted institution well ahead of business, government, and media. That stayed like that for 19 years until the pandemic when government became the most trusted institution. But that lasted a very short time um, because people were disappointed in the performance of government during the pandemic. And then it moved to business. And this year, again, business is the most trusted institution. So in terms of long trends from NGOs to government to business as the lead institution. The second big trend is clearly, Fred, the mass class divide on opinion. The reality that the bottom 25 percent has a very different view of institutions than the top 25 percent that in fact we see this year that the divide has become transversal. It's 20 points in China. It's 20 points in Germany. It's 20 points 
or more in markets like Thailand, et cetera. So it's no longer the U.S., U.K., and France, which is where it started a decade ago, leading to Brexit and Macron and Trump. Um, it's now quite global. The third big finding over time is that trust has become local. Trust historically was a top-down phenomenon, um, you know, Jesus from the Mount. Um, then 10 years ago or 12, started to go peer-to-peer, -peer, horizontal, um, through social networks, people like me who I learned from. It's actually in the last couple of years gone local. Trust is in my company, my CEO. In fact, my company newsletter is more highly trusted than mainstream media for mm. quality information. The last big finding, which is tied to this, is the battle for truth. And I know how strongly you feel about it as an ex-journalist, um, but the reality is people don't have an agreed set of facts. And this has only been worsened by the pandemic. And the reality is that low trust in social media has dragged down trust in the media sector altogether. Uh, mainstream media is now categorized as untrustworthy. Um, and so I think it's, it's a fundamental problem for society, especially democratic society. So let me try and use the slides and just briefly go into um, this year's um, data. The first key point is that trust is tied deeply to economic performance and to expectations of economic performance. So in fact, the highest trust countries in the world tend to be in Asia. Hmm. They tend to be developing markets. They tend to be more single party or you know, kingdoms as opposed to uh, democracies. And the problem for this year is in nearly all the countries of the 28 we surveyed, we see 27 of them declining in terms of economic optimism. Only 10% of French and Japanese believe that their families will be better off in five years. That is a very bad sign for trust and leads to low belief in the future and it's exacerbated by a higher level of fears. The fears last year were job loss to automation and sustainability. Now this year, it's the cost of living. It's also nuclear war. So you have more logs on the fire. The second force that leads to polarization is institutional imbalance. What we observe is that in countries, it could be South Africa, for example. If business is 30 or 40 points higher than government, uh, in terms of trust, it inherently means that you're in a low trust society. What you want is a table with equal legs. You don't want the plates to be able to be sliding off. And so what it does is puts business under pressure to step into the void left by government. The third big point, which I've covered already, is the mass class divide. The people in the top quartile think institutions are great. Their reality, even through the pandemic, is I could work remotely. Things are good. You know, my stock market portfolio has been pretty darn good. Um, and my real estate's soaring in value. Meanwhile, the people in the bottom quartile had to go to work from day one. They had, in some cases in the U.S., two and a half times worse death rates than the people who were affluent. And so there's a, just an increasing sense of inequity. The inequity that was felt after 2008 bailout is repeated in the bailout of the pandemic. The last is this battle for truth. The echo chamber is making it harder for society to solve problems. And so again, we have a further polarization when there's very low trust in media. So those are the four forces. Now, I want you to understand that when we categorize countries, we see that one quarter of the 28 countries that we study are polarized. It means that the social fabric is frayed. It means that people don't believe that their divisions can be overcome. There is a healthy state of debate in the countries in the middle, in Australia or Canada or Thailand, like this. I would argue that in the bottom left-hand corner, you have many single-party states. Um, and and or hugely happy states, India, you know, soaring in terms of the economy. The countries in the top right-hand side have many of the four forces that we've discussed. So in the United States, for example, you see that Republicans only trust government 
and media in the low 20s. Democrats, by contrast, trust a government and media in the 60s. So that's one aspect of divide, meaning you have institutional imbalance. You also have frayed social fabric. You have a mass class divide in the United States of 23 points. It's the second highest of any in the world. So all of these things are causing polarization where ideology becomes identity. It's one thing to be a fan of the Utah Jazz. That's fine. Or the Bulls, <laughs> hopeless as they are. Um, but the reality is it shouldn't affect your behavior. It shouldn't be a zero-sum game except when the Bulls play the Jazz. Um, so, look. Uh, he, uh, he's from Chicago. I'm from Utah. This and that's is, what happens. I, I just want to let you in. This is a little bit of insider dope here. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And, and we're this, really lucky that both of our teams kind of stink this year. That's but, true. Exactly. But, although Utah Jazz have a good chance. I understand. Anyway. We'll, this we'll, carries we'll, on. Okay. <laughs> so... Do you, what I want do you, you trust to trust the Chicago. Never mind. No, let's go on. <laughs> no, I, not with a lead. Anyway, so <laughs> what I want you to observe in this chart is the significant change in how business is being perceived in the last three years. Business has had a great pandemic. It also has actually responded to George Floyd's murder by really focusing on diversity and inclusion. And most recently, and most importantly, business has gotten out of Russia. And over a 1,000 companies have recognized their ethical obligation to depart from Russia. Compare that to South Africa and apartheid, where only 250 companies got out over 20 years. One year, over 1,000. 20 years, 250. A fundamental change in how business perceives its role in society. So what you see is business is left as the only institution that is both ethical and competent, the only one in the top right-hand corner. Government parked way down in the bottom left, both incompetent and unethical. So frankly, not a good scene for trust. Um, so just as a frame for navigating in a polarized world, because these problems are not going away. The DeSantis Disney or the attacks on Larry Fink uh, at BlackRock by Texas Pension Fund. I believe deeply that business needs to continue to lead. Business leaders, CEOs especially, are expected to stand up and speak up. 85% of those in our study across all the countries say, I want CEOs to stand up and speak up. By six or seven to one, more action on sustainability, more on diversity and inclusion, more on immigration on issues that are historically not in business's wheelhouse, but on sustainability, diversity and inclusion, wages and reskilling, and now on geopolitics, business has to continue to lead. Second, business has to collaborate with government. By four to one, people say to us, I want business and government to work together. That's a different approach than that taken by some industries. Tech has said, leave us alone, we're fine. That's not going to work. They're not elected. Even if they have superior technology, which they do, AI, et cetera, needs a playing field. Third, we've got to get back to economic optimism. It's a shocking statistic that we have every democracy, every developed democracy, under one-third belief that my family is going to be better off in five years. It's a driver and an outcome of polarization. We need business and government to make sure that there's fair compensation retraining, make sure that local communities get invested in to address this mass class divide. And lastly, I feel deeply that business has to be supporting advocates of the truth. We have to make sure that brands invest behind platforms that are improving the civil discourse, because if we can't get to an agreed set of facts, we'll never come to good outcomes. So I think that's a decent enough summary of the trust barometer, and now we can do some questions. Um, it's a great summary. Um, uh, I, I want you, you'll be happy about the first question that's come in uh, because I want to share this with the audience as well. So Michael Stopford, uh, uh, who teaches at Georgetown, says, will this video be uh, available later, very useful for the class I teach at Georgetown? So yes, it will be available. We'll put it on our website. And uh, uh, you play your cards right, you might even get Richard to come talk to your class. So, so Michael, thank you for your question. Um, the, uh, I'd, I'd like to get to the, 
economic uh, optimism question because partly what interests me about the fact that you've done this for 23 years is you can see trend lines. And, um, and, uh, and you know, it's plummeted, but has it plummeted over time? It's been it dips, or is it a trajectory that's, uh, that's going down? And then how does that economic optimism um, point, and uh, as you said, you know, 40 percent, only 40 percent, say that they and their families will be better off in five years, and that's not fulfilling the American dream or any other dream, uh, national dream. Um, 10 per point decline for 2022. So how's the trajectory over time, and how does that play into polarization? So actually, during the pandemic, economic optimism uh, remained stable. Yeah. <laughs> it's only in the last year that it went down. And we think it's because we not only have societal problems, we now have personal problems, meaning we have fear of nuclear war or, you know, I can't pay my heating bill or I have the question of heat or eat. Uh, and so, in fact, economic optimism is really a function of do I also think there's going to be a recession in the next 12 months? And am I going to lose my job? And am I going to have downward economic mobility? And in fact, the least trusting part of the United States is the Midwest, which has been the most affected over the last two decades about global, by globalization, outsourcing, and downward mobility. Um, that, that's a great answer. You know, I'm, uh, there's interesting questions coming in, so I'm going to mix Please. our conversation with the questions instead of have a, having so, sort of a strict moment for 10 to 15 minutes of questions. We'll just do them as they come in, and, and I've got my own list of questions. Uh, uh, but this is from your, form, your, your fellow uh, board member of the Atlantic Council, General Clark, General Wes Clark. And he says, and thanks for, thanks for, for watching, General Clark. Uh, who I was just in Bali with at the G20, so it was great that you joined us there too, General Clark. We usually hear that the U.S. in the U.S. that the military is the most trusted institution. I don't think you actually measure that. No. So, so what? But, but uh, so the question is: do, do your findings address this? I think no. But it, but do you have a more of an answer than that? Do you have an insight? I, I, ha I have an insight for him. Um, one of the consequences of the pandemic is a devolution of the role of experts. And so part of the population deeply trusts government. They trust institutions. They trust the CDC or FDA. And then there's part of the population that doesn't. And it is partly correlated to income. It is partly correlated to part of the country. Um, and it's also correlated to do I read mainstream media? Am I relying on social media? Um, so a coworker today has equal level of trust as a scientist. A coworker and a scientist have equal level of trust. This is a complete reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, uh, uh Make a comment about which coworkers, but scientists. But uh, but the uh, uh, um, I wonder if uh, I'm going to ask a question. But in the meantime, I wonder if we can get the slide back up on the countries. Sure. Uh, um, is, is that possible? So yeah. Th so this slide, and uh, we can put up the screen for our our viewers as well. Um, it's interesting to me uh, the severely po polarized and, and not. And I, I wonder if you can talk about one or two of these countries, why you know, uh, you'd be more polarized in Argentina, Colombia, the US than, say, France, UK, et cetera, where you know, particularly UK and France have gotten some, some pretty deep things. The other thing I see here is uh, uh, non-electoral democracies uh, seem to have their act together if you look at this. Um, does that mean the weaknesses in, in electoral democracies? That, or, or is it just that we're going to be more polarized because we fight out elections and, and we, we, we do this out in the open? So I'd love to have you reflect on this really, really interesting chart. So Fred, one of the observations that we make on the countries that are in the bottom left corner, there is very little difference in trust in the key institutions. In other words, between media, government, and business. More or less, 
you know, in India, they're all in the 80s. Similarly in China, all in the 80s. That's point one. Point two, over a five-year period, they've had superior economic performance. Mm -hmm. Point three, they have, in general, less mass class divide, um, more sense of fairness, more, more sense of opportunity. Um, you know, did they have a better COVID? Not necessarily, no. Um, but did the economic outcomes from COVID have a effect on widening the gap between rich and poor? No. Whereas in the United States, you could argue that it increased the divide between wealthy and less wealthy. And, 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 uh, and would you say that you trust your survey results uh, across all countries, or is it just harder in some countries to survey than others? I mean, it's harder in some countries. Yeah. We, we repeated in one country twice just to make sure that the data was the same. We did cities versus west, et cetera, and it came out the same. So again, I think when you ask about uh, Argentina, failing economy, huge delta between business and government, and uh, distrust in media. It, it's, it's the poster child for polarization, but the US, relative to those other countries, has the best performing economy. Sweden shocked us. You know, Here's a happy country that suddenly is not happy because the rise of the right, this sense of issue around immigrants um, who came from Syria, et cetera, and that was a real outlier. Really interesting. Um, the, um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, you particularly drilled down and looked very closely at Germany. Is there one country you saw this year and, and, and you said, wow, this is per of particular interest and that you'd want our audience to, to think about? So I just came back from Germany, um, and I think the reality is they don't have any huge divide between business and government. The big change is the mass class divide, mm. which I have not seen before. Uh, it's now 20 points. Wow. So uh, in fact, people in the lower echelon um, are really feeling the inflation and really aggravated uh, about the threat of nuclear war. And so I think Germany is, you know, very <laughs> movable, <laughs> unfortunately. It shouldn't be, but it's... Uh, little spooky. Um, let's talk, I, I, I'm really interested in the mass class divide. Um, I, I want to go to that question also, how you've watched that trend develop over recent years and over time. And I was interested that in, in your opening comments, you included uh, China uh, in the 20 point mass class divide, which I think would be surprising to a lot of people. But on the other hand, we've seen increase in protests. We've been seeing, seeing some increase of, of uh, what seems to be uh, distrust in government. But it's, uh, 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 so two questions. How have you seen the trend evolve? And then secondarily, uh, uh, answering in China and where, wherever else you think it's particularly interest this mass class divide. So I think the core of the mass class divide is a sense of unfairness. If I have an equal chance to get ahead, I'm okay with there being uh, wealthy people, um, as in India. Um, but the reality of being condemned to being in the bottom quartile and not being able to feed my family and not being able to heat my home uh, and, you know, 15% or more of workers in financial services. Uh, and, and real estate, et cetera, are gonna be you know, eliminated in the next period. And there's no effort to really do retraining in a substantive way. Uh, and so I'm definitely um, afraid. And when I'm afraid, I have my fists up and I um, become much more agitated and much more willing to listen to information that suits me. And so, that's why all of this is circular. And I think that actually media and government are a bit of an a death, death embrace at the moment mm -hmm. because unfortunately media tends to cover people who generate clicks <laughs> and the extremes generate the clicks. And I don't think that media should, should do that. Media should be about authority and, and, and expertise and 
education and advocacy and in one way or another making sure society is able to function with facts. Uh, so let me pick up a question on that point. Um, you, you noted earlier I spent 25 years of my life at, at the Wall Street Journal. Sometimes people say to me, um, uh, you know, do you regret leaving journalism? And I said, I, my answer to them is, when did I do that? Uh, because to a certain extent, we're doing that here. And, um, uh, you know, what we learned over, over the period of COVID is we can have an audience here where people get to know each other, they can network with each other, they can, they can respond live. Uh, but we've got much larger audience globally watching right yeah. now. I don't know what the numbers are, but they're always in the thousands. Um, and, and for this in particular, I think it would be high all across the world. Um, the question from Robert Charetta is, reflect a little bit more on the fragmentation of the media. In a nation of 330 million, we don't see any major media outlet reaching more than a few percent of the population. So it's not just a battle for truth. It's, you know, people are in their own cocoons, listening to their own media, reinforcing their own biases. And I actually see that's partly a, a space for the Atlantic Council organizations like ours. And we now much more quickly put out responses to events. We don't try to, we're not trying to be a news organization, but we, for example, have something at the Atlantic Council called fast thinking. Because when you have Putin invading um, uh, Ukraine, that is when disinformation from the Russian side is going to be flooding the airwaves. And it's a time when people actually have to come in uh, with, uh, uh, with what I call light and not heat. Uh, and that's what we try to provide. But, to, but answer Robert Charetta's question about uh, this uh, no major media outlet reaching more than a few percent of population. Then I'm going to start watching for our live audience here, too, to see uh, if we have any questions. Well, Fred, the economics of the uh, newspaper industry, as you well know, have been terrible. And the number of reporters in local newsrooms is down by more than half. And so um, the New York Star Ledger is down from 300 to 50 reporters. And so, you know, it's hard to have accountability uh, journalism. And so organizations like yours can fill a really important void, um, uh, particularly on global uh, affairs. And I also think it's an important question. Um, if my company newsletter is the most important source of information, then what is the job forward? So during the pandemic, I can tell you as an instance, um, uh, Several of our clients found that their newsletters were the most important source of which vaccine was safe, um, where to get appropriate uh, advice about, you know, uh, do you take a fourth booster or a fifth, and, and, and what about my parents and how to take care of them. And so the job of the company, a newsletter, again, to fill this void left in mainstream media is important. I also believe fundamentally that companies need to improve the flow of information to social platforms. Because if 28% if of people are using uh, you know, social media for primary source information, you know, it's only as good as that which is put into it. And so we all have a responsibility, if we have the facts, to put up those facts and at least debate with those who are doubters and say, you know, this clinical study is actually important. Take a look at it. Here's a link. Um, and, and get in there and engage and don't back off even if people criticize you. That's so interesting. Um, you know, let me drill down a little bit more on this trust of business. Um, <clears throat> it is interesting that it's been there uh, and, and, uh, and keeps uh, returning to the fore. Um, though in Davos and elsewhere, I've been hearing more debate over whether it's really business's business to be getting into uh, uh, social areas, political areas, otherwise. So on the one hand, you're arguing that it's inevitable they have to. On the other hand, you're starting to see some blowback and some pushback against this. How are you seeing that trend uh, um, evolve, and what advice do you give the, the CEOs who you give advice to? We say very clearly to companies, stay in your swim lane. Make sure that you have value-added knowledge. So if you're Pfizer or AstraZeneca, you have every reason to be part of improving the global healthcare delivery system. Making sure, for instance, that people in lesser developed markets get access to vaccines. Uh, making sure that doctors are trained and can you know, do that kind of work. At the same time, I think 
companies have to be careful to distinguish between being public advocates and taking care of their employees. So for example, on you know, gun control or, or voting rights or other, um, you can make a case if you are in a given headquarters city that you should be part of the process of making sure that people have the right to vote and, and, and democratic process. But do it with other companies, don't go solo. Make sure that you talk to your employees first and communicate with them, listen to them, get their views, um, reflect their views. Uh, and then third, uh, decide to take care, for example, of your female employees who need to have uh, medical services um, in, in a country where you know, part of the states are saying, you know, we're not going to allow abortion. Um, you have to talk to your employees. That's the first. And then decide which issues on which you can be a credible public advocate. Every one of them should be involved in sustainability. Diversity and inclusion needs to also now consider religion, gender, and race. Um, on on reskilling, it's a crying need um, for upskilling. You know, the German model, as you know, Fred, is something that um, apprenticeship and et cetera is, is, is clear. And then this last about um, we need to keep pushing companies to get out of Russia. You know, what Putin's doing is just insane. Uh, thank you for adding that at, at, at the end. Um, uh, you know, when you see the layoffs that are coming from companies right now, I, do, I wonder whether you're going to have uh, not more pushback, but more understanding the first obligation is going to keep people employed to, yeah. as well. And so mixing that with, uh, uh, with uh, these, more, these softer social skills, um, you know, if, if the person doesn't remain employed, you know, that's not going to mean a lot to them that their CEO is saying the right things about ESG. No, Fred, you're totally right. The first obligation of business is to make money. Yeah. Um, but in making money, there, there's, just, there's, just, there's just not a dichotomy between making money and doing your social obligation. Yeah. Because you can actually insource jobs. For instance, the Discover card company put 2,000 jobs to inner city Chicago, um, and they're delighted with the results. These are the best workers in the company, and the CEO is putting his headquarters in the South Side. He's going to work there because he's so happy to be with these people answering customer problems. We need more of that. That's a great story, terrific story. So I'm going to watch here. I've got lots of questions, really great questions coming in from all over the world, too. Uh, I don't see one in our live audience, so let me go. Uh, and forgive me if I don't pronounce this right, because this could be uh, a, a, a French, German, or American name. So it's Gerard, and I'm going to do it in the German way, Moishna. M-E-U-C-H-N-E-R. Uh, Richard, uh, uh, what is the optimal balance of trust among institutions? So you're saying this is where we are, but what is the optimal balance of trust uh, among institutions in a healthy functioning society? Should government, business, and NGOs each claim an equal share of trust, or is it just naturally going to be moving differently than that? So it's, it's Gerard, and I know him. And, okay. um, I and how do you, you pronounce did, You last did very name? well, Muchner. Oh, good, Muchner. Very well done. So it is a German name. Yeah. Great. Um, it's a German name. Yeah. So I would say um, India has a pretty good uh, model, um, high trust in government, a very active um, business community um, with you know, Tata and Mahindra and others um, being innovative and supplying new jobs. Uh, and also a very active media sector and civil society, which we haven't talked at all about. And NGOs in the moment are not actually seen as that competent in India. They're a very important uh, part of uh, society. Talk, talk about uh, NGOs a little bit more. I have a question here uh, from the audience about what's happened to trust in NGOs and why. So it should have been prime time for NGOs between the pandemic um, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, I think, and uh, the you know, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. These are all issues that civil society should be leading on. And then, of course, sustainability. But actually, NGOs have been crowded out by both business and government in terms of voice. We actually tracked the NGO voice during COP27, and it was minimal relative to what it had been in prior COPs. And so I think it's making sure that they're having measurable 
goals and showing that they're deeply competent because that's the thing that's actually been receding over the last few years, this sense of competence in NGOs. And then also just to have more voice. David Miliband in, uh, is an example of someone who does at the IRC. Um, so again, uh, a good question from um, the global audience, uh, Leslie uh, Chafkin. Um, uh, and this gets to what we've been talking about on, uh, on technology. We have a geotech center, and a uh, geotech center uh, is, is partly about harnessing technology for good, actually largely about harnessing technology for good. Uh, but partly what we're trying to do is bring together communities that don't talk to each other enough, and that's Silicon Valley and, and, and policymakers in Washington. And there's a lot of distrust in these two groups. Uh, Leslie's question is, um, uh, what trends are you seeing regarding technology and trust? Are the same class divides you observed reflected in attitudes toward technology? And Leslie is a non-resident fellow in our geoeconomic center here. So Leslie, the important stats are tech continues to be the most trusted industry in the world, but there are some cracks in the uh, edifice, specifically in the United States, where we actually saw a 20-point drop over the last uh, seven or eight years in trust in tech, and that is partly questions about social media, but it's also um, a sense of, you know, maybe not happy about job replacement by machines and um, like this. So, but you, you can cite Google, for instance, your honoree Sundar um, in the Atlantic Council dinner uh, was honored for the work that Google did in making sure that um, Ukraine was able to continue to be well-informed, um, and that uh, the YouTube channel was uh, maintained for Russia so that citizens there could get another version, and making sure, in fact, that uh, disinformation was being disabled. And uh, how do you explain that, um, you're right, there's that story, there's also FTX. Uh, why hasn't that put more of a chink in the armor of, of business and its, its reputation for being ethical and competent? So, in fact, um, crypto is trusted at 30% uh, as of last September. I can imagine it's probably in the teens now. That also had an effect on trust in the U.S. Um, unfortunately, innovation in tech is less trusted than the tech industry overall. People associate tech still in their heads with cell phones or PCs or things like this, or search, um, but the Sad reality is the more innovative parts of AI, et cetera, are trusted like 40%. So AI, by cataloging 200 million proteins, we're going to see the advances in medicine quite quickly. But there have to be guardrails um, that people understand uh, that government is keeping up with business. Um, and then um, uh, Margaret Talif, um, asking about K-12 and community trade schools, universities, and what role should they have in addressing, uh, addressing uh, trust trends? Teachers are the most uh, trusted to bridge gaps in society. So you're acute in pointing out the possibility for government in investing in education and making sure that um, kids at all levels of the economic spectrum get a chance that way. And uh, so, that's a clear to-do for um, government, and business should help in that, either through money or expertise. Um, these, are, these are just terrific answers, terrific questions coming in. Uh, I'll look again to see if anyone, ah, we've got two questions in the audience. Let's take these two right here. And please identify yourself. Thank you. Good morning, Fred. I'm Beverly Kirk with Syracuse University, and I want to go back to the mass class divide and the loss of trust in the Midwest. Um, was it the same in rural and urban areas, or did you delve into that divide at all? Great question, Beverly. Good to see you here. We're doing that for this year. Um, we're partnering with Harvard B School on this exact subject of rural versus urban. And so I'll, I'll tell you shortly. <laughs> but. I actually came up and gave a commencement address at Newhouse some years ago, and on the way to uh, campus, I saw a closed uh, GE plant that was sitting empty, and I thought to myself, this is the basis of trust. 
The, the difference between Midwest and the coasts could be a hint of where uh, uh, urban versus rural could go. But potentially. what's interesting for you is <clears throat> there's huge expectation of institutions to provide fairness in the Midwest, but the delivery thereof is the most disappointing. So the gap between expectation and the due is like 40 points. The rest of the country is like 10 or something. So. Please. Hi, I'm Sharon Moshavi with the International Center for Journalists. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about authoritarianism and how trust is related to authoritarian countries and whether you see a correlation as spaces close in countries, because we see a lot of increasing repression, whether that has there's a correlation between that and trust. And just taking India as an example, it is a, it is a democracy, but there's a pretty strong closing of space for media, for civil society in India. So I'm wondering if there's any relationship between that. There's, <clears throat> there's one hypothesis that the difference in information issued by government and by media in those countries is very small. Whereas here, you know, media is doing its job and saying what they say on Capitol Hill is not true. Um, then there's the real question of economic performance. And so there's much higher trust in media in those countries that are single party than there is in democracies. And so maybe because there's one line. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm not a fan of authoritarian <coughs> government. I, I'm a guy kid who grew up in democracies. Um, but. The system works in terms of trust, and that's all I can tell you. <laughs> and you have to draw your conclusion about the closing space and like this. Uh, so uh, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you for the questions here. I'm going to close uh, with a, a double-barreled question that <clears throat> comes from the audience and, and, uh, and my sort of <clears throat> favorite question uh, to ask someone like you. Uh, the double barrel questions, you've been doing this for 23 years, you probably didn't think you were going to do it for 23 years after the first one. Why do you think it's so important to continue to do it? And then secondarily, um, uh, what are you seeing uh, right now uh, that keeps you awake at night in this survey? Uh, in other words, something that is bothersome that we just don't really know how to fix at this moment, perhaps. The reason that we do these studies, Fred, is we want to push institutions to better. And I'll give you two examples. Um, Lisa Ross, who runs our US business, and, and I um, pushed our research team to do a study in the weeks after the murder of George Floyd about whether business and brands should speak up. And we found by seven to one Democrats, two to one Republicans, we want business to stand in and, and speak up and do something. And so we went around to clients and said, come on, you got to do something. And Lisa worked with KFC, for example, um, uh, to put together a fund to enable African Americans who were store managers to be able to buy into franchises because they had an insufficient number of franchisees who were black. Solve the problems. So I feel really good about that. And I also feel that. Um, by identifying with a special study we did on health, uh, the reality that we have a bifurcated uh, audience now, one that believes in Dr. Fauci and institutions and, 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 and another that needs the ground game. And, and, and so you have to talk to the local MD and the pharmacist and get information locally. And, and so again, hopefully pushing clients to recognize they have to talk to both in different ways. Same facts, but talk to them both. Um, what keeps me up is this um, slide behind you about the number of countries that are in danger of severe polarization. Um, Brazil, I think, has slid into it. Um, and Lula's remarks this morning about Russia uh, are just too much. but. Um, it, 
And, and I was in France last week, and people say Le Pen is a serious contender for uh, the presidency in a couple of years um, because, you know, the Macron party's, you know, in a bit of disarray. So I think, again, business has every incentive to be part of making sure that society functions well. And that's our job is to push clients to understand that action builds trust and that they have to improve the facts on the ground. They have to make sure that the people in the bottom 25% of income feel a, a sense of hope and that uh, society is working. Um, and government does have to be focusing on education and other things in which it can absolutely make a difference. Um, so that's what keeps me up. Uh, but that's a great place to end, which is action builds trust. Uh, uh, that, that whether it's a business leader, a government leader, or uh, a media owner, uh, it's action toward trust that builds trust, and it's, it's, it's not a static thing that just happens. No. And so that's a really pl good place to end. Um, I'm really pleased by the way things have been evolving at the Atlantic Council in terms of what we learned from the period, extended period of COVID is we exponentially grew our global audience. What we've learned from coming back is people want to be together and uh, and have some breakfast uh, in the in the uh, lobby uh, and chat with each other and uh, and we are all hungry to uh, uh, be with other human beings again as well. So I, I think this is the way we're going to do going forward because why give up the global audience? Uh, but it's really great to see you all here in person as well. So thank you, Richard, for just thank a terrific you, program. Thank you so much.